Hi there. So today, here we are back again for another interview in the series for dog owners that will help you to discover the secrets of dog experts and transform your connection to create the best friend you've always wanted. Today, I have Kim Brophy here. Did I say that right? Yes. Good. Good. Thank you. She is an amazing trainer and she is the owner of the or the founder, I guess, of the Dog Door Behavior Center, where they do some amazing work. I love your uh, discover the key to your dogs. Um, that's that's right up my alley with helping people. And you're just doing so many amazing things. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. I'm hoping that we can uh, come up with some some ideas and ways to help owners connect with their dog. And using your own words is is fantastic. Um, you want to how about can you tell me how you got into how you got how this dog door dog door behavior center with a key now i wish i had a picture mm -hmm. in front of me your little the logo <laughs> is so cute how did that happen how did you get into that center? um well as a kid um i was that dog nerd so you know spent my childhood surrounded probably by more dogs than than other children if i'm being frank but the kids were still loose in atlanta at the time when i was growing up there in the late 70s and early 80s and so you could literally just walk out your front door and have neighborhood dogs come and join you. And so, um, you know, I was probably like set up for this from an early age, but then I went to college um, for applied ethology and then uh, started the dog door in 2000. So um, have been doing this ever since. I'm starting to age myself as I say all those years out loud. And you have a center, you do all sorts of, of work. Um, yeah. Yeah, we work with clients there. To, you know, it's different than what most people think of when they think of a training center. And, and I, I like kind of explaining that as a behavior center, it's um, it's not set up in the way people kind of imagine where like you go into what feels like a little bit of a sterile or a kind of industrial environment in a typical training center. Um, and the dogs are kind of going through their paces, right? Like their obedience skills and things like that. And we have two consult rooms that are set up like family rooms, like your family room at your house would be. Um, and the whole idea is that the dog can interact with the environment in an organic way, as long as safety allows for that. And so the dog is safe to allow to walk around the environment freely. And we can get a lot of information uh, about the dog for the owner through those observations and seeing it's kind of like Sarah Fisher's free work um, model in that way and uh, and then we can also just start capturing free shaping some different behavior um, explaining for the owner you know the kinds of things that we're seeing build a organic rapport with the dog um, that isn't forced and and it's it's really a remarkable kind of starting point for uh, getting to the bottom of what might be going on for that family. That sounds amazing. That sounds awesome. So yeah, you could have the whole family come and, 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 spend and they some often time. do. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, that's what, <laughs> yeah. And that's what you want, right? You've right. Seen, yeah. Wow, absolutely. Is that a great idea? That's yeah. a fantastic idea. So when you talk, I'm just going to, because I know I thought about this, you talk about a, a, a par paradigm shift. Paradigm yeah. shift. So what, what, can you explain that? What's your meat, what's your, what that would mean? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting because there are these things that kind of come along um, over the years in culture that that don't get questioned till they do. Right. And I think dog training is one of those things. I think we all um, because we aren't kind of uh, living in a time pre dog trainers. Right. So even though for 10 to 40,000 years, there were no dog trainers. Um, there were just dogs and humans coexisting, partnering, living together, sharing experiences, um, functionally accomplishing tasks um, for, for survival and hunting and farming and all these things that were really necessary. Um, and it was a real nice symbiotic kind of relationship there. And it actually, in much of the world, that's still the way that it is. You know, So 80% of the dogs on the planet um, are cohabitating with people as free roaming village um, dogs. And so... Uh, you know, we have this idea in America for the last few generations um, and, and very much so kind of the glimpse of time that we're in right now, where we have pet dogs that we train to obey our commands um, and they're captive and domesticated, but the captivity part is actually very new um, in the kind of historical evolution of our relationship with dogs. Um, and, and we just are a little bit 
uh, left field, um, or I should say, in my opinion, very left field in terms of our kind of projections, assumptions, understandings about what dog behavior is or should be. So um, when I talk about a paradigm shift, I'm talking about, you know, a reality check for the culture and for the profession of dog trainers, because we're all kind of stuck in this weird um, approach where the, the customer, the client comes to a professional dog trainer with a list of all the bad behaviors they want changed and a list of all the good behaviors that they want out of the dog, as if the dog just is a product that's like a blank slate that is supposed to be what they want it to be. And we've all kind of accidentally endorsed that narrative, right? In the pet industry, in the dog training world, you know, in the culture that that's what pets are for. You know, they're here for you. They're supposed to be exactly what you want them to be. So um, we then hire someone to make it that way and to program it um, and train it to, uh, you know, ob oblige us, whatever those things are. Um, and it's really quite divorced from all the natural sciences, um, from evolution, from biology, from ethology, neurology, genetics, epigenetics, all these other lovely, very legitimate scientific disciplines that help us understand why behavior is happening in the first place. Um, so I think the paradigm shift is, is moving in that direction to understanding and getting to the bottom of it rather than just starting it, how to change behavior. That's so well said, you know, I, I am so, I'm so happy that I got involved with dogs when I did, because I see, I see how it was in the past and and I'm always been force free and I, you know, I so much empathy you can put myself in their position. And I just often thought like, even as a child, some of the things that we were told to do were awful. Yeah. And, and there was no such word as a dog trainer. I think they were around in those days, but definitely nothing ever said in my home. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it's what it, yes, it's huge. That was awesome. Well said because, um, you know, helping dogs to learn how to live with us. They are not born with that. No, especially not in the captive conditions that we're suddenly finding ourselves in. Like, right, we forget that that's new. We forget that 100 years ago, most people were still living largely outdoor, agrarian, like manual labor kinds of lifestyles and realities and family home environments. And then the dog could kind of, you know, be along for that and be a part of it. And I don't think, you know, even though the leash laws and the kind of, um, you know, restrictions we've put in place have been for good reason and for safety and the interest of consideration of other neighbors and things like that, um, it's really robbed dogs of their, their natural niche in a way, you know, um, and yeah. so the, the idea that it's normal and appropriate to keep an animal inside for 23 hours a day and possibly crated for eight to 10 of that, if not more. Um, the idea that we don't have any responsibility to meet their, their behavioral output needs, um, you know, to express the behaviors that we humans have artificially selected them for painfully for, you know, hundreds or thousands of years. And then all of a sudden we just don't want it anymore. We just want it to be a pet, but we like to keep the shape and color and size of whatever that historical breed was like, it's just so divorced from reality. I, it's really unbelievable that as, um, as much as we love our dogs, that we are so left field when it comes to understanding who they actually are. And it takes time. Like it's something that, that since they're born with it, like you say, it's not just a quick fix. Right. No, no. And, and that's why, you know, we need a more comprehensive uh, approach to it, you know? Um, and, and I think the first the first step is for people to um, recognize the whole picture. You know, that's why I wrote my book, Meet Your Dog, for the public, not just for professionals, because as, as complicated and multi-layered as, as the, the var variables that go into making up who our dogs is, we all are responsible for understanding that there really are, you know, this many moving parts. And so the legs model of learning environment, genetics and self gives people a tangible palatable framework for even starting to think about the true complexity of their dog as an animal, just like we would be, you know, um, and all the things that go into making us behave the way that we do. They're really not different in that regard. Even if we are more complicated as a species, 
all the same fundamental tenets and operating principles are still there, still going on. Um, and so that book is, is something that any dog owner can use, um, any dog steward, any dog family can use in order to deepen and expand their appreciation of what's really going on. Because oftentimes, training is kind of rendered obsolete when you actually understand. That's the interesting thing, right? Is that if you really understand and you shift your expectations and your behavior, because that might actually be what the problem is, then suddenly you might not have a behavior problem at all. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, um, cause I, that's the same. So I really focus on mindset mm -hmm. and you're, you're just, you're definitely going into a deeper level of, of that, right? Like it's all so much more in understanding what's going on and, and what they need and not to make them like a human, but they have so many feelings and needs and, and things that, that are deserve to be addressed and respected. Um, and the biggest thing to me is that they do want, they want us to help them figure out how to fit. Yeah, they want <laughs> us to, and, and they need us to. And, you know, I think it's really easy for people to dismiss it as like, um, oh, this is philosophical, or it's like an ethical thing to talk about dogs' feelings and all of that. And, and I would really um, like to state quite strongly that this is a matter of science. This is a matter of practical reality. And the cost of not having a good grasp of the scope of what's going on for a given dog is what unfortunately we continue to see in shelters and in the dog behavior professional world. We've never seen the level and the severity, the frequency of behavior problems in dogs that we've seen these last few years. You know, we really have a mounting mental health crisis in our dogs and a lot of dogs lose their lives over it. I have one that would have, he was, he's a foster fail from the rescue. And he was um, taken in to be put to sleep for, for biting. And I just, from day one, I thought, well, somebody just didn't understand this dog and he was afraid, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's, it's really kind of as simple as that. And, and I mean, you know, in simple words and he's a total love bug. Yeah. Like, and I keep on thinking that I always think about that. He was maybe some kid's dog and that somebody's missing him. I, I know I talk about him yeah. a lot because he's such a fantastic example. He's so smart. Mm -hmm. and and yeah you're that's I really hope to get this information out there so that people will try and start connecting with their dogs uh, before they get labeled and right. and and to help them fit in because the dog wants to and needs to his life depends on it yeah no absolutely and and that's why you know um I, I'm kind of proposing that we do away even with the whole concept of dog training which I know is a um it's bold and it seems excessive, but when you really think about it, it starts us in the wrong place. We start with this like attitude and mindset that we're the puppeteer. And so we can manipulate the behavior by training the dog and, and not, not really taking into consideration the fundamental invasiveness of training in the first place, right? If I, if I manipulate your behavior against your will, which is absolutely possible, we know from all the operating principles of behavior modification and learning, that's really invasive, right? And so whether we should train should absolutely be the first question. And so that's why, you know, we've kind of introduced this model of family dog mediation because the idea in that is that you have these, these parties that both have needs, both have wants, um, and they have to come to an agreement. They have to meet in the middle uh, where there's kind of a contract of terms in that relationship where both matter. And, and our job is to be able to identify and work with all those moving parts as a professional and help guide people through that process in the interest of all parties. And yes, sometimes that does involve, I'm gonna pick up this tool of training and I'm gonna show the dog this, or I might pick up this tool of training and show the client this, you know, because sometimes we do need to change our behavior, but it's so much a, a smaller piece of the puzzle when to train, when to teach. Um, um, then the overarching relationship, the environment, the genetics that come to the table as part of that entire recipe, you know, all of the things that are going on in the internal environment for the dog's self. It's just so 
complicated and we're not helping by just kind of dismissing all that because we would rather focus on the job at hand of teaching the dog to do what we want to, to sit do. and stay and stuff right yeah i i really understand that and i i know um i i currently am working with a client who um another speaker had said the word uh, uh, uh command poisoned Mm-hmm. and and I've never heard that like I never that was just a good way of saying it and so just teaching them to play to just mm-hmm. connect and play and and to be to just right. be with each other uh is definitely something I I think that I, I actually was thinking about like getting a play class going like 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 you it's yeah is people need to yeah. just connect and interact and and <laughs> it's awesome I love what you're doing that that sounds like a really so how long does it this might be a difficult question but how 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 often how long do they usually have to keep coming is it like a whole bunch of sessions it must take a while you know ironically i would say the majority of our clients we see under three times and um some people we see once that's it solve the problem. Thank you very much. We identified the heart of what the matter was and we got right to it and they implemented the stuff and things just instantly improved. That is actually a really common story. Um, and, long, and even long as with the, committed. Yeah, right. As long as they're committed. And actually what I found is that I don't have the owner compliance issues that I hear other trainers, you know, kind of talking about with their clients because frankly, the public feels like a lot of the stuff we've been giving them to do with their dogs is like chores and it feels arbitrary and it feels super technical and it's not what they want to do at the end of the day. And so I am all about pushing the easy button. I have nothing to prove with my clients. I have nothing I need to show off my fancy skills about like if we need to implement some kind of fancy level, you know, complicated mechanical uh, stuff, for instance, like in handling cases, you know, that's getting a little bit more mechanical um, and talking about making sure that our timing and and our um, mechanics and all of that are are much cleaner to avoid the dog becoming stressed or defensive. Um, But in most cases, the solution is actually a lot simpler and it's a huge relief to the clients that we can just do A, B, and C, shift the way we're doing, you know, those things. And then all of a sudden they don't have a problem anymore. And, and I think dogs are so pragmatic and they're so literal dogs, I think really appreciate just kind of getting to the heart of it. And they really appreciate when interventions are offered that provide immediate relief. You know, that's a concept my colleague, Andrew Hale talks a lot about. Um, and, and I, it's so critical, right? Like what will create the relief for the dog and for the family? Like that should be what matters most, you know, not how shiny and polished and impressive something looks like we've got to get the ego out of it and you know and once all that gets there all the other stuff would be like like you say obedience training and all that stuff is just kind of the bonus extra outside stuff but that's not yeah that's not the true relationship right it's kind of like you, you know you don't you don't need to have like high level complex skills on the dog you need to have agreement right it's like you know i look at it as um things like sit and lay down and wait and come and whatever like they're not commands. Their communication about context and appropriate behavior in different contexts, in the same way you would raise a child, right? Like it's it, you wouldn't raise, or I would suggest you don't, unless you don't have a good relationship with your child. But you wouldn't raise a child to just respond without context to your instructions when you want them to do things just so you can remind them that you can make them do things whenever you want them to and that's kind of what we do with dogs we're like marching them back and forth in a parking lot in a training class (laughs) no contextually appropriate reason for a sit or a down or a stay or a come and then we repeat them over and over like the dogs are bloody idiots and and the dogs are like what are we doing why are we doing this this doesn't make any sense as opposed to saying hey like when we sit down someplace in public I need you to chill too. Like you'd teach a kid, like, honey, we're just chilling. We're waiting here for a minute, you know? And dogs are so much more amenable to our suggestions and advice when it seems contextually appropriate. Like they are not the simple idiots that we've made them out to be historically in our minds. Yeah. And that they have a choice. The choices are so important. It's so, it's so interesting when you say that because I'm, I am addicted to rally obedience. I just love doing rally. 
Yeah. Um, and as long as I have, you know, a good paycheck, <laughs> they right. love it. They love yeah. it. Um, but it's really funny because, yeah, you can see they're like, I've already sat 10 times. Why are you asking me to sit again? You know, you can well, see it. It depends <laughs> on the dog, right? Yeah. Though, like there's some dogs I, I would strongly wager that you don't see as much in rally as you do other breeds. And there's a reason for that. So like, you know, it's, it's genetically self-reinforcing to certain breeds of dogs, types of breeds of dogs that were selected for close attention to and cooperation with a person. So that's actually in their ethology template, right? So it's, it's self-reinforcing for a herding dog or a gun dog to work with you. Um, and so However, you get into like the natural group or you get into the guardian group and, you know, their interest in some of this stuff is going to start falling off of a cliff where they're like, why do you want me to sit again? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like the cookies and all, but what are we doing? You know, yeah. like, and, and so instead of saying what's wrong with the dog or what's wrong with your training or what's wrong with the owner, we should get comfortable, like understanding what we're looking at and saying like, but that's, that's appropriate for that particular dog. You know, yeah. they're not all going to like training. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I, <laughs> I think saw a great Pyrenees that came and I just, I don't really think this dog likes not this a complete. lot. I, I, I have a Pyrenees mix and <laughs> she'd rather die than do rally obedience. Like <laughs> she'd be like, I'm getting back in the minivan. I know. I mean, <laughs> she likes treats and she likes, you know, learning things to a point, you know, but it's, it's about some sense of relevance and context for her. Um, and she's definitely that dog that would not, would not understand that context. It's so interesting that, you know, the way, like this whole conversation is very interesting. Um, and I really agree with just getting the dog in the, you know, especially these rescue dogs and stuff, right? Like getting them used to the environment and used to living with you and understanding each other and just being not come sit, do, you know, like I, I and I think about children a lot, mm -hmm. how very similar they are to children, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and it's, and it can be fun. They love fun. Mm -hmm. like fun is fun makes it more fun <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah it gets more and different cooperation things are fun for different dogs you know um and and I think sometimes we want them to think what we think is fun <laughs> and yeah. sometimes it's not you know <laughs> sometimes like, they have really different ideas like um, getting a ball some dogs good luck and other ones you can't stop <laughs> Oh yeah. I mean, you know, my, my Pyrenees mix would, um, Pyrenees Newfoundland, but she would watch a tennis ball roll right past you and, you know, just be like, are you going to get it? Why do you roll that? Why do you throw that? That's weird. You know, and at the same time, she loves cardboard boxes and toilet paper rolls, right? Like that's fun for her. Um, but the idea of kind of like fetch or, you know, stuff like that would just be so completely uninteresting. Now, part of that is, of course, genetically for that group, they also have low dopamine. So like, they're just lower arousal. It's harder to get them excited about things. It's more you know? work. <laughs> yeah, it is absolutely more work. So, um, you know, I, I think figuring out and asking the dog and being curious about that, like, what is fun to you, as opposed to what is my idea of what will be fun with you, is is critical. And, and, and so therefore that goes back to that piece of the expectations and our mindset about what we're working with in the first place. And, and part of it, frankly, is getting away from the narrative that it's all how you raise them because that kind of endorses that idea that we're God, right? That we're like the puppeteer. And if we just raise them a certain way, they'll be what we want them to be. But we are not that powerful. And they do bring their own phenotype to the table, you know, of, of all of these different variables. Um, and, and so fighting that instead of accepting it is kind of a fool's errand. Yeah, it's true. And so just getting to know them and even watching, just watching the dog and you see what they learn, what they was. I talked to a client today and she said something about her dog, you know, likes to take everything out of the laundry basket. And, and I figured that's got to be the lab in it. <laughs> I'm figuring it's probably the lab, but, you know, the dog is talking. So here you've got an example of, of a way to maybe find a way for something for the dog to do instead of getting right. in trouble. And, and he's showing interest and wants to do something. Right. <laughs> right. And sometimes we can look at the misbehavior we're getting and say, what does that tell me about who he is and what he would like to do? Right. So rather than say, nope, I'm going to put a brick wall in front of that. My dog destroys things. Okay. He loves shredding things. And he shredded my comforter and all my pillows and my clothes and my rugs. It's like, well, what can he shred? 
And how can we like take that behavior and open up another opportunity and encourage it and develop some nice neural pathway flow in this direction while we also then manage to prevent the rehearsal of those directions like your sofa and your cushions and all of that. Because it's not the destroying part that's wrong. It's the what of why destroy part that we need to kind of address. Yeah. And it kind of wrecks the whole fun of it for them when you come in and you get upset. <laughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now it's, you know, that's, <laughs> that's no fun at all. You know, it's one of the reasons we did get into, um, you know, cardboard with my girl is she, just, just thinking... she really, she likes to eviscerate things. And when her molars came in at nine months, she really liked shredding things. And she also liked swallowing them. So one of the things about the cardboard is as long as you're not using the corrugated cardboard and you're just using things like toilet paper rolls and stuff like that, paper towel rolls, um, it's appropriate for her to shred it and even eat some of it if she wants to. Um, and, and oftentimes what clients end up doing is they're so concerned that a behavior is bad that they just take all opportunities to express that behavior away, which just increases frustration and the likelihood that that pressure is going to show up someplace else. Yeah, it can make it so much worse. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, it's and and there's so many things that are important, like with the chewing and the they need that for all it gets all like, their endorphins and everything going. And it's so inbred in them to be able to chew some of them. Some of them really need it to shred. Yeah. <laughs> I have a yeah. I actually two of them. If I throw a paper, crumple it up and throw it, they'll just shred it. They won't eat it, thank goodness. Yeah. So I call them my paper shredders, but it keeps them yeah, busy. So, absolutely. Yeah, that can be a whole lot of fun, you know, um, and whether that's barking or chasing or, um, you know, wrestling or whatever that might be, figuring out where can I put it? Where can I put that behavior? Where can I give it a home? Uh, Gene Donaldson said years ago, you can't put a brick wall in front of a natural behavior, you know, Um and uh, she also made some comment, I'm going to misquote it, but it was great. She was like, you know, if dogs were like cars, humans would be um, trying to drive them across a lake and then suing the manufacturer when it didn't float. <laughs> <laughs> Something yeah. along that line. So that's pretty spot on. Yeah, yeah it's true, you know, and, and, and I, you know, we're going to, I would love to, that's the idea of what you're talking about with, with the, um, meeting with the family and doing uh, mediation yeah. and just it's just it's really what it is mm -hmm. it's I, and then and it sounds like such a great thing for everybody to understand that just <clears throat> sorry spend the time to get to know and help them understand because they don't know how to read their dog a lot of times so it's okay to get help with that we can help with that I think families need that help more than they need dog training right like dog training is kind of something fun to do, but uh, most of our clients have been through multiple dog training programs and none of them have touched their actual problems with a 10 foot pole because they're not really getting to the heart of it. And so most people who have dogs in their lives are less interested in that kind of dog training format that we've been just repeating because it's what we've had. It's what we've been taught, you know, is this kind of obedience model. Um, and they really just want to be able to coexist peacefully with their dog, you know, and really love them and want to get to the heart of it. You know, that, that's what most people want, but they just, they almost haven't given themselves permission to look at it that way because they have all these things going on in their heads saying, you need to train your dog. You need to make your dog obey. Your dog is bad for blah, blah, blah. Um, and you're going to so, look bad if you can't get your dog working right. Right. Or yeah, I mean, and so we need a whole army of family dog mediators, frankly. Um, that's why we're launching the professional course. You know, it'll be at Wolf Park in August, and then in September, it will be available online. But we've just opened up enrollment for that this last month. Today's actually the last day of early bird enrollment. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the first of its kind course for any professionals or for rescues or shelters or people in the veterinary profession or groomers or daycares or kennels or um, boarding or, you know, yeah. right, dog walkers, um, yeah. pet sitters, like, you know, anyone who is really invested in the welfare of dogs in the modern age, frankly, can benefit so much and their clientele and inner circles can benefit so much from them getting the knowledge of the big picture of why dog behavior is occurring in the first place and why we're seeing so many behavior problems that aren't actually even abnormal or pathological. They're just evidence of the kind of dysfunction that they're having with the current environment and expectations and you know model that we're using. 
And um, it, it's been really exciting watching the passion that has come out of the industry just in the last year, as people are finding that there is an alternative way to approach behavior beyond that kind of operant model. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I agree. That's all so well said. Well said. Because okay. it's, it's dogs are, dogs are, like you said, discover the key to your dog. Mine is my, my saying is discover your dog. Yeah. Because right? there's so much in there. And, and when, when you find, I, I wish I could remember the exact words from another speaker too, that I was, but it was um, just when you see it, when you see that connection, when you see something happen like that, it's just, it's the, your heart, you know, just warms right up and you're like, and the person usually is like, oh my gosh, I saw, you know, I'm connecting. And, and yeah. when they start watching and realizing what they're seeing, you know, they didn't come with a manual. That's why we want to help. Right. <laughs> we want to help understand. And we're always, I'm always learning. Every dog yeah. teaches me something. Oh, me too. Me too. I mean, and that's one of the fun things about being in this profession is if you're really open, instead of kind of coming in, like I'm the expert, I have all the answers and this, this agenda, it's like you come in with that same humble curiosity and the desire to help, like each dog stretches us further, you know, outside of our own comfort zone and what we knew yesterday. And then, you know, they pose new problems and questions and opportunities for us to see things and understand new things. And it's just awesome. Like, we, we would be better people for listening to them, you know, and animals in general, like we, we don't do them justice when we dismiss them as less than when they're really not, not at all. No, they're not. They're quite amazing. I couldn't imagine life without them. And, mm -hmm. and they're such, so you know, when, when they're smart and you, and you're connecting, it's, it's, you know, it's just such an amazing feeling to connect yeah. and understand my dogs and to, and other dogs and to, and to see them open up and be, blossom you know, suddenly the dog that wasn't listening was listening, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, just wasn't getting the response that he needed or, you know, it's, it's dogs are so often telling you things and I'm, yeah. and I'm I want people to start listening. We can help them. Yep. Yep. We, we could all, you know, grow tremendously and help them at the same time. It's, it's kind of like, um, it's almost like therapy, right? Like we're asking the family to come to the table as if we were, you know, a therapist working with a parent and a child. I mean, it's, it's almost a more appropriate model for what we're really doing. And sometimes the kid needs some better skills, right? They need some better operational models. You're like, you can't color on the wall. Like that's <laughs> not cool, <laughs> you know? So we need to talk about where we color and where we don't, but we also need to make sure that the parent understands that maybe the whole reason that they're coloring on the walls is because you're ignoring them all the time. And you have an expectation that the child interacts with you only when it's convenient for you. And you're not really recognizing the scope of the child's emotional, mental, physiological relationship needs. So that behavior is actually not even about coloring on the wall in the first place. So it's not even about teaching them where to color. It's actually about why are they feeling the need to get your attention in less than optimal ways because you're not taking the bait when it's optimal ways and appropriate ways that they're trying to get your attention. And those are the kinds of game changing insights, right? That sometimes yeah. like if we just don't say them out loud, the reality is the dog's going to come up with something other than coloring on the walls, figuratively speaking, right? It'll just, it'll take a new form that, that behavior, if the heart of the issue isn't addressed. Yes. Yeah, definitely. That's so it's, it's it makes such a difference for dogs to, get along with their people and, and fit in. I'm so yeah. excited. It is a very exciting time for dogs. And, and, and I, and I see that I see more, you know, all, all more and more force free, you know, and, and play uh, more and more incorporation of play into training. And uh, yeah, it's looking really good for the future. Yeah. It's I'm very hopeful. I think this is the beginning of, of a real paradigm shift. I really do. I think you're right. I, I feel, I feel like I've been in that. I'm mm -hmm. seeing and hearing, you know, different, different training and things already and different wording. And, and even with the sit, we've even talked about in rally how, uh, because I do agility and I do, I do a shows and we're kind of actually working on a little show right now um, for a meeting in zoom, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, uh, we used to do shows, but we're still in lockdown. Um, but um, we just, we were talking about how they don't, we don't, we don't need to even make them sit every time. Like right. some dogs don't like it. And we just, well, why, you know, do we really need to make, if we're going to do a class and we want to have fun, you know, want to keep it fun. So, and that's just coming into the conversation. 
Well, and that's cool. Like, right. you know, I, I heard um, Victoria Stillwell do a Facebook Live right before her big dog behavior conference last month. And she was talking about how she was questioning the entire concept of like, why do we feel like we have to make them sit? Right? Why, why are we so stuck and rigid about these certain ideas that this is what the dog needs to do. And it's like, but do they really? It's kind of like, it's so robotic. It's so, um, it, it's not that none of that is, is good or important or potentially contextually very appropriate or even fun for the dog, as you say, but we should be curious about it, right? We should at least yeah. question our own assumptions and habits about that stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's true. You know, it, it feels, the more I think about it, the more I feel like dogs don't have many choices. And I love no, helping don't. them have choices and helping them have the right choices and to yeah. make them happy and get what they need out of it. Um, yeah. Like you absolutely. say, if you were asking me to, you know, if you were telling me to do that. So when you said it that way, um, yeah, it's, I would not like it at all. If you were telling me to come all the time and, you know, I'd be at some point, it wouldn't be nice. <laughs> Well, right, you know, and, and, and the irony is, is that like we have um, this, what uh, Kayla um, McKenzie, but I think it's Kayla Fratt, um, Journey Dog Training. I did a, a podcast with her um, on what, she, you know, a variety of things, but one of the things she was mentioning was the choice and control paradox. And the irony is, is that like we've robbed them of all this appropriate agency as captive dogs and we basically want them to oblige to what we want them to do all the time and yet we have to be really careful when we're talking about things like choice because there are choices that our dogs are not prepared to make right in this modern set of like unprecedented conditions and expectations that they frankly don't know how to navigate so you know i've, I've said on a couple of podcasts like mike shikashio is about you know the idea of giving them choice they can't handle is this it's a burden it's like saying to you would you like to go fly a helicopter you can do anything you want and push any button and fly it any way you want and you're like that seems scary not fun right so if we put them in situations that have a, a set of contextual variables, a terrain that they don't know how to navigate, they're not equipped to, then saying you can do whatever you want is horrifying. And so getting really like clear and objective about, okay, so like what does healthy opportunity for choice look like? And then when is it appropriate that we're the parent and we take the reins because the kid has no clue what to do? Yeah. It's complicated. It's very complicated. Well, and it's just um, even working with fear, fear dogs because somebody uh, we were talking about, um, oh, sorry. Like, like, well, you know how, if you're gonna work, try and help a behavior, you kind of have to see what's going on. You kind of have to initiate a little bit or something. You hear lots of different opinions on how to do that, but it basically one theory, right? Is that you initiate the behavior um, to, to fix it, to work with it. and. Uh, she was told that with her fear dog. And mm -hmm. I says, you know, if, if you, I'm terrified of haunted houses. If you stuck me in a haunted house and closed the door, like that would be terrified. And that would definitely not help the problem. No, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a lot of misconception, misunderstanding and, and people, um, you know, reading different things. And especially the internet can be mm -hmm. a little scary. You know, I saw something about this and they're trying it. And it's, it's really, you know, taking time to learn the dog and working with what's in front of you and not, yeah. not uh, paying too much of attention of all that other stuff. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's connecting with what you've got. I love yeah. your, your center sounds amazing. And the courses sound amazing. Yeah. Well, I hope you take it. I'd love to have you. And yeah, you know, I'm going to definitely. Listening, they don't have to be a professional to take it. You know, they could just be a super dog nerd and they'd still get a lot out of it. Absolutely. You should send me a link for it. Oh, I yeah, will. No. You can put I'm it gonna, in the show notes. I'll finish this and we'll talk for a sec, okay? Sure. Thanks a lot for coming today. Um, whoops, my computer. Sorry. Kim Brophy. Great interview. Hang on.